Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oils with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is God's word for God's people. You may be seated. Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's pray for our time in the word, and then we'll get into that story. Father, uh, man, we are grateful. Um, we're grateful for your, you sending your son. Jesus, we're grateful for your teaching that we get to read and study in spirit, we are grateful that you make this known to us and you illuminate it to us and you, you convict us and you encourage us and you comfort us and you rebuke us. Uh, and so God, I do pray that whatever we need as a, a community, whatever we need as an individual in these moments, I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would give us sharp minds and soft hearts as we come to Matthew 25, that we would know it, that we would understand it, that you would make it clear to us by the power of your spirit and that you would help it draw us into worship. Um, that we would want to follow you, and we want to live differently in light of the truth of the gospel. So help us in this time to do that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, Jared mentioned this weekend we had uh, our annual uh, family conference. We got to focus on marriages, and uh, I was talking to one of our friends who was there, and uh, they've been just going through a season. Like, you know, when we, you're just kind of going through it. Right? Like maybe you know people right now, or maybe you are kind of the people where life is just like hard, you know? And for some people, it feels like it's just like thing after thing after thing. And that's kind of these friends for us. And so it just feels like hardship after hardship. And I was talking to her, and she mentioned uh, that through this season of suffering over the last couple of years, one of the main things that God has done is she said that he's given me this like deep longing for heaven. Uh, she said that it, it had like never before, and she's been a Christian for a while. She's like, I've never had this like a desire to long for or live for heaven in such a way before these trials. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that where um, life, you know, it just is hard at times, where suffering comes, where it just feels like, man, it's one thing after another. And there's this thing that God begins to do in your heart in those times where you recognize this world and this life, what's going on inside of me, isn't as it's designed to be. You know what I'm talking about? These moments where you just have this longing for something to be made new, something to be made right, something that's broken to be restored. Now, there's a, a critique that is often given that if Christians think about that too much, or if we focus too much on heaven, and if our eyes, if all we're thinking about is this kind of like, you know, quote unquote, pie in the sky type, like everything's going to be great then. If all we do is focus then, then we'll be of no earthly value. Have you ever heard that? That this idea that if we're so fixated on heaven and God's redemption and the second coming and, and living in light of that, we actually won't be of value here. We won't be the salt and the light of the earth. Uh, but that's simply not true. Uh, let me give you a few examples of people who, who kind of help us to see that that's not true. Um, C.S. Lewis, in his famous book, Mere Christianity, says this, uh, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world are precisely those who thought most about the next. 
He's saying the people that actually do the most in this world are the people that are so fixated on the world to come. But it's not just Lewis. Uh, the Apostle Paul actually says something similar. Do you remember what he says in Philippians chapter one? Uh, by the power of the Spirit, he's writing this, and he says, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Can you imagine? Like death being gain. You know, I remember uh, there was a time a few years ago uh, in the midst of just a lot going on in the church and ministry is 2020, like just crazy. I was having health issues, like just a lot of pressure. And I literally remember this vivid moment. I know where I was in my car driving to a bank. Like I literally know exactly where I was. And it was this moment where this concept, like have you ever had where like you know something theologically and it's up there and then you have a moment where it clicks and it kind of like shifts down into your heart. You know what I'm talking about? Like you know it, but there's a moment where it like becomes real. Like it actually gets in there. And at a moment where this became real, this idea where Paul says in Philippians 1, he's like, look, if it was up to me, death is gain. It is far better, he says, not because death is great, but because he says, I am freed to now be with my Savior. He says, that is far better to be in the presence of Christ, to have all things made new. And I feel like I felt that for the first time in that moment, that man, there's just so much here that death is gain. But Paul goes on to say in Philippians 1, he says, and while that's true, as long as he has me here, I'm here for you. Does that make sense? So Paul's saying what C.S. Lewis said. He said, look, I'm so fixated on the beauty of the next world that I am freed in this world to live for others. He said, I'm not looking for things out of this world. As long as I'm here, I know I'm here for you because when I pass through death, I get eternal bliss for me. Now, it's not just Lewis, it's not just Paul, but that's exactly what Jesus is going to be talking about in this teaching here in Matthew. Okay, so if you got a Bible, uh, go to Matthew 25. Uh, if you remember, Last week, we looked at this teaching from Matthew 24, and this is the same like section of teaching by Jesus. And he ended the last section by talking about his second coming, when Jesus returns. And he talked about when the end of all things happen, he comes back, he's gonna make all things new, his people are gonna be brought into presence with him. And now in Matthew 25, he's going to teach us that if we're confident of that end, if we're fixated on that end, then how do we live today in light of that end, right? Like how does that day, when he comes back, impact this day? Like the life we live. You remember last week we talked about these uh, last days that we're in. We're in this stage waiting for Jesus to come back. And he's saying in between this stage right now, how do we live now in light of the end? Uh, and what he's going to do throughout Matthew 25 is he's going to tell us three stories. So we read one of them, um, but we're going to hit two other ones. So the whole chapter is broken up into three stories. And it's going to be three different ways, kind of like three markers of his people and how we will live today in light of that day. Uh, so the three stories, I think he's going to say that his people will be prepared. His people will be faithful. And his people will be loving. Uh, so first one, this first story, Jesus tells his followers that we must be prepared. Um, now, before we get into this story, uh, let's remember this story is what's called a parable. Uh, and we haven't actually taught on parables for a little while. So uh, just by way of reminder, uh, a parable is a fictitious story. So it's kind of a made up story that's trying to make one point. Okay, so the, the way that we get off in parables is if we miss the main concept or idea that it's actually talking about. So it's making one main point about an idea, or if we try to make every piece of the story fit a theological purpose. Okay, that, that's not how parables work. So what Jesus is doing is he's telling a general story, making one general main point so that we can understand an idea or a concept. Okay, so one general story making one general point to help us understand one idea. So as we're reading parables, we should read the whole thing and ask, okay, what's the main point of this story and what are we to understand from it? So that's what we're gonna do in these three different stories. So we come to the first one, the parable of the 10 virgins. So we need to ask, okay, as we go through this, what is the main 
point? What is going on in this story? Uh, Since Luke just read it for us, I won't read through it, but just by way of summary, uh, essentially what's going on in the story is there's a a wedding, and the groom, who in the story is Jesus, uh, he, uh, they're getting ready for the wedding, and he goes away. So in a Jewish common custom, the groom would go away, kind of prepare a place for them, and then he would come back. You see already, as we're talking about the second coming, this picture here we talked about last time, he came, he ascended into heaven, he went away, And now we're waiting for him to come back. That's kind of the scene of the story. Now, as he goes away, we get introduced to these 10 virgins. Now, um, the way that that's used, it it could be translated like a young woman. And in our minds, if you think of wedding, think bridesmaids. That's essentially what these 10 women are. They're, They're bridesmaids. They are there to help support the wedding. And their role is when the groom comes back, they are gonna help him be like ushered in. They're gonna be with him and usher him in. Now, the story says there's five wise women and five foolish women. And now Jesus is gonna set us up um, to basically see who we are. And this, again, this is where we can't be too literal with parables because we are the bride of Christ, right? So we are married to Jesus in that way. But in this story, that's not where he's placing us. He's placing us within asking, are we gonna be the wise women or the foolish women? Okay, so the bridesmaids, uh, Jesus is taking longer than they thought. Okay, so the groom hasn't come back yet. Uh, and so the five wise women, they grab, because one of the things they need to do is have these lamps or torches to help, if he comes at night, to help usher him in. So they grab a bunch of extra oil, they get all prepared, and they're wide awake waiting for his return because it could happen at any point. The foolish women don't take extra oil, so they're not really that prepared. Uh, and it says they get sleepy, so they go to sleep. Now, as they're asleep, all of a sudden they hear this announcement that the groom has come. Okay, so out of nowhere, all of a sudden, they weren't prepared for it, probably in the middle of the night, here he comes, he's now here. So the women kind of wake up and they say, okay, uh, we don't have any oil. Like we, don't, we weren't prepared. So they go to the wise women and they're like, hey, could you give us some oil? And they're like, no, we're not gonna give you any oil. They say, you need, like, we don't have enough for everybody. We have enough for what we prepared for. You have to go and do this on your own. So they go off to buy oil. But while they're gone, the groom comes, the five wise women meet him, they usher him into where the ceremony is, and it says the door shuts. Now the five foolish women, they come, they're knocking on the door, they wanna be let in, and the groom says, I do not know you. And it says they're left outside. Okay, so that's the story, that's the parable. Now we gotta ask ourselves, well, what's, what's the main point? What's the takeaway here? And this doesn't happen in every parable, but in this one it's nice because Jesus actually gives it to us. You notice that? Look at verse 13. He says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So the main question for us in this parable, uh, as we think about how do we live today in light of that day, the question is, in this age, are you going to be wise or foolish? Or in other words, will you be prepared for his second coming. That's the definition of the wise and foolish. The foolish were not prepared. The wise were prepared. And I love that he tells us at the end, he says, uh, we don't know when he's coming back. He said that last week, remember? We don't know the exact time or date, but we must be prepared for whenever that day comes. So let me ask you, as we think about Jesus coming back again, what are you presuming upon for salvation in that day? Okay, that's a loaded big question. The, if, if presume, it's kind of like, a, what are you assuming? What are you banking on to be saved or to be good with the groom when he comes back? More specifically, when Jesus returns and he comes to you, because the reality is you will meet him face to face when he comes back, what are you presuming upon that will make you right with him? What are you presuming upon that will uh, be your salvation on that day. Um, I think there's actually three false presumptions that we can fall into that we actually find in this story. So just honestly assess or reflect here. Uh, Let me ask you first, do you presume that right now you have plenty of time to get right with God? I think this is a dangerous one for many in our culture. Um, We have a full life to live, especially in our church, right? A lot of us are younger. We've got decades, we think, 
to live. We've got plenty of time. We've got years ahead of us. We will get right with God at some point down the road. Uh, this is the foolish women who fall asleep. They assume, well, Jesus wouldn't come back now, so we'll figure out the oil, we'll get ready for him, all that stuff later, because he's not gonna come back at this point. We think, you know, once I get married, then I'll take this stuff seriously. Once we have kids, then we'll focus on kind of getting our spiritual life back on track. Once I have fun and I do the things I wanna do in life, then I'll do the God thing. Once I get my life figured out on my plan and my track and my way, then I'll consider God. If you are presuming that you have plenty of time to get right with God, Jesus is saying this is a foolish life. Because the reality is, if we do not know the day or hour that he returns, we are not guaranteed 20 years. You are not guaranteed two months. You are not guaranteed two minutes. Like, do you actually believe that? Because if Jesus means what he says here, that means you are not guaranteed two more minutes. Do you presume that you have plenty of time, that someday you will get right with God? I need to plead with you. You need to get right with God now. Like, for us to be good with the groom when he returns, for us to actually meet Jesus and have that be a good thing one day, is for us to actually acknowledge our sinful place before God and the reality that we need Jesus to save us from our sins. That our salvation on that day has to be based on the grace of Jesus alone. We need to deal with our relationship with God now. Second, do you presume that you will be good with God on that day because of the faith of someone around you? Here's what I mean by that. We can fall into the trap of believing that I'm good because my parents are Christians. I'm good uh, because my friends are Christians, because I'm in a room full of Christians, because my spouse is a Christian, and if Jesus comes back and I'm in the crowd of Christians, I'll kind of just get swept up with them, right? Like, like whatever happens then, as long as I'm around Christians, their faith will be good for me. This is like the foolish women who in that moment say, hey, you prepared for this, give me some of that oil. Like now I need it, so you give it to me. And they say, no, you have to do this on your own. You will not be judged on that day because you were from a Christian family, because you go to church, because you're in a city group, because your spouse or your kids are walking with Jesus. You will be judged on that day on your faith in Jesus, your relationship with Jesus. We cannot presume that just because you're in a church or you're around some Christians, you're gonna ride in on their coattails. We need to deal with our relationship with God and our own faith in him. Lastly, do you presume that God will never truly judge and his love will win in the end. This is the foolish women assuming, you know, the groom's nice enough. I know we didn't listen to him. I know we didn't take him seriously. I know, you know, we didn't really want him until the very end. But now, of course, he's gonna let us in. Like, he's not actually gonna shut us out, right? You notice the end of the story. Once that door shuts, the door shuts. Hebrews tells us there is going to be a point where judgment is coming. There is going to be a point where his grace and patience and mercy will then stop and judgment will begin. And there is a point where we cannot say, however I live doesn't really matter. And whenever Jesus comes back, then I'll, then I'll follow him. You're hearing the gospel now. You're, you're hearing the word of truth now and you will be judged on what you do with it now. Do not presume that one day God will say, yeah, all that judgment stuff, I'm not gonna do that. I just love everybody, I'm gonna let them, and he is giving you the chance now to receive his grace and mercy. Jesus is saying, do not presume, prepare. Prepare for that day by dealing with the gospel of Jesus today. First, we must be prepared. Second, if we ask then, what does this life of being prepared actually look like? Uh, the next two stories are basically following up on that. Okay, so if we're called to be prepared, deal with our relationship with Jesus now, what do we do moving forward? Uh, the, the first story that he's gonna tell next, the parable of the talents, is his call for us to be faithful. That his people will live a life of faithfulness. So uh, I'll read a few verses to kind of kick us off and I'll kind of explain as we go through this. So look right away at verses uh, 14 and 15. 
This is his next story. He says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. So again, verse 14, the master, that's the, the picture of Jesus here. And again, we're seeing this like time frame stuff. So he was here with his servants, then he goes away. But before he goes away, notice that he gifts his servants with some uh, talent. So this is, again, this is in the in-between age where he's now gone away and we're waiting for him to return. This is the age we live in. And it says that to some he gave, or to one he gave five talents. A talent is like a, a large sum of money. But in the parable, it's really saying he's gifting them with some sort of resource. So you could think, this could be money, this could be any kind of resource that you have, gifts that you have, um, responsibilities, influence. This is what Jesus gives you to do, to work, to deal with, to use in this time period. So he gives five to one. Uh, this one will then go and he is faithful with that five and he actually earns five more before uh, Jesus comes back. The second servant, he gets two talents. He works with those and he makes two more and then the third servant got one talent, but he did not faithfully work with that talent, but he buried it in the ground. Now, notice what the master does with each of these. So first, the first servant comes and he says, look, I, you gave me five, I, I faithfully worked with those five, and I have now five more to give you. Look at how uh, Jesus teaches this in verse 21. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The second servant does the same thing. He had been faithful. He earned two more. He goes, and the master says the same to him. But then the third servant came. This is the one who was given a talent, didn't faithfully use it or work with it, but just buried it. And listen to what happens next in this interaction. Uh, start in verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Jesus, Jesus teaches us that because of this servant's sloth or laziness, uh, he was not faithful to work with the resources he was given, and therefore, when the master returned, he casts him away. So again, we gotta think, all right, what's the main point of this parable? What's our takeaway here? And I think what Jesus is teaching is that while he is away, we must be faithful with the work the gifts, the resources, and responsibilities that he has given us until he returns. And notice, those that are faithful, what did they get? They received affirmation for their faithfulness. They received more responsibilities. And they received the joy of their master. That means that they get to enter into his presence. What did the one who is not faithful get? No affirmation. He got no more responsibilities, but he was met with judgment. So we need to ask ourselves in this day again, are we living for the end by being faithful in the present? One of the ways that we live in light of that day is that we are faithful with what God has given us in this day. Church, Jesus has given you gifts. He's given you talents. He's given you resources. 
He has given you influence. He's given you some power. He's given you some relationships. He has given you a body. He has, he has given you things. Everything you have is a gift from him that we are called to be faithful to in this day. You do not own your things. You do not own yourself. You are a servant of the king who has given you it all. And your call is not to make sure that you achieve every outcome or every dream of yours. Your call is to be faithful. Living for the end means being faithful in the present. Uh, I'll tell you one of the main ways this has worked out in my life is uh, when I first became a Christian, uh, I've probably told this story before, but my conversion and my calling into ministry was like simultaneous. Like, like at the same time, I was converted to the faith and I felt this calling of I need to go into ministry. And so pretty early on, I started uh, kind of because of the, the people I was around, the people I listened to, the pastors that I read, all this stuff. Uh, in my mind, it was quickly cemented, and some of my own sinful flesh was mixed in here, um, that if I really wanted to be a pastor, like, like to live for God, man, I had to do all of these like great things. Like I needed to plant and you know, be the pastor of this massive church. I needed to preach to thousands of people. I needed to plant hundreds of churches. I needed to, all these things, and my kind of mind was set on and fixated on doing all these great things. And to be honest with you, uh, what I was really kind of doing in my soul was I, was I was chasing this idea that one day when I met my Lord on that day, when I meet him, I was chasing this idea that he would say, whoa, <laughs> like look at all the fruit that you put on your tree. Like look at all the things that you've done. Like you, you outdid yourself. Like this is not even what I have. This is more than I could have asked or imagined. Like, like you had all these things that you were doing and you lived, so, you worked so hard and you did all of this. Like, man, I am so proud of all of this fruit. And I was fixated on my fruitfulness. But did you notice that throughout the scriptures, we are never called to control the fruitfulness of our lives. We are called to control the faithfulness in our lives. And we have to ask ourselves, are we so concerned about the outcomes and the things that we get to do, or are we concerned with being faithful to the things God has called you to do? That is what we are called to in this life. And sometimes God will explode that and fruit will come. And sometimes you'll barely see any fruit. And it's not about the amount of things you're doing, the amount of money you have, the amount of gifts you have, the amount of talents you have. It is about being faithful to what he has given you. I do believe, and I think I can say this, I think I can genuinely say this honestly, that the Lord, over the last couple of years especially, has slowly shifted my heart that I genuinely, on that day, just want my Lord to say those six beautiful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Like, th there's so many things we cannot control in life. But I know that I am called to walk with Jesus. I know that I am called to love and lead my family. I know that I am called to pastor this congregation. I know that I am called to steward my body and my money and my resources. I know that. And I just want to hear him say on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into my presence. And could we be a church that is striving after that? Like just after faithfulness. We'll have different amounts of money. We'll have different amounts of talent. We'll have different amounts of influence. But whatever the Lord has given you, will you strive to just hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, don't try to be someone else. Don't try to live someone else's life and calling. Don't try to earn Jesus' affirmation on that day by overperforming in life. Just be faithful. Be faithful to what he's given you. And may we be a church that works well, serves well, gives abundantly, honors people well, loves sacrificially, and are faithful to what he's called us to. And this calling of love, remember we talked about this a few weeks ago, this like we're to honor and love God and love others. That's actually where he ends this whole section um, and his final story as he talks about that. His people will be loving in this day. Part of our faithfulness is being faithful to being a loving people. 
Now again, this, this whole story, the rest of the chapter, uh, is this one long kind of parable. And so I'm not gonna read it all, um, but let me give you a little bit of the context and then we'll get some verses. Uh, this final story, uh, he now compares people to sheep and goats, all right? And he says that on that day, he's gonna come back and he's gonna judge and he's gonna separate people. And he's gonna separate sheep on one side and goats on another Now, listen to what he says, speaking about the sheep, starting in verse 34. We'll go to verse 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? They're shocked. They're like, we never saw you do that. When when did this happen? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers you did it to me. All the sheep get to enter into his presence because they were a people of love. Let us not be confused on this point. It is not because they were a people who had this superb theological, intellectual knowledge of the Greek word of love. Notice that it's not the people who have the clearly defined strategies and structures and have all the arguments on how we should love and what love doesn't look like. Notice that. It's just the people that loved. Like you catch that, you catch the simplicity of this. He says, just the people who gave somebody a drink of water. Like when they saw a need, they met the need. Did they have it all figured out in their mind how they're doing this? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But it's the people who just simply loved one another. And the final section is is gonna speak about the goats, the other side. And it's essentially just the exact opposite. He says all those things, and he says, you did not do these things to me. And they again, they say, wait, when did we not do these things for you? We never saw you. And he says, what you've done for one another, you have done unto me. Think about that, the beauty of that concept and the value this gives to us as a people. Jesus is saying, as the head of the body, he says, as you love one another, as you love my people, You are loving me. He so connects himself with his people as we're united in him that he says, the way you love me is you love one another. The way that I know you love me is that you care for one another. And this whole passage gets summed up in verse 46. Speaking of the goats right away, he says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The end for all the wicked apart from Jesus is eternal punishment. And the end for all the righteous in Jesus is eternal life. Now, um, before we wrap up, I I do think there's one question that's gonna be helpful for us to get our minds around from these last couple stories. um, Because this has kind of gotten people off here. And I think the question is this. In these last couple stories, is Jesus teaching that it is your works that earn your salvation. Did you notice that? And a lot of people have taught this, that he's saying, if you love each other, then you get to be saved. And if you are faithful with all these works, depending on how faithful you are, then you get to be saved. And if you're not, you're not. So is that teaching here that it is your works that are earning your salvation? Well, no, I don't think so, okay? Uh, many passages throughout all of the scriptures, even in Matthew, time and time again, uh, we are told we cannot earn our salvation. That it's not, we cannot earn or achieve our salvation. We simply receive our salvation in Jesus. And if that's true, if that's what the scriptures teach, then, then what exactly is Jesus saying here? Well, I think Jesus is saying that your works do not earn your salvation, but they prove your salvation. Okay, you are not saved by your works, but your savior, your salvation is proven by your works. Now, this is not just here. This is all throughout 
the New Testament. Uh, Paul, in Galatians 5, he says that any Christian has the Spirit of God inside of him and therefore the fruit of the Spirit in their life. So he's saying, for anybody who's saved, you get the Spirit. And the Spirit then works himself out in you by the fruit of the Spirit in your life. So how do you know if you have the Spirit of God inside of you? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is being played out in your life. Your works are proving what is true of you. Uh, John says in 1 John 2, he said, if you want to know if you love Jesus or not, he says, we know we love Jesus by following his commands. That's not what makes you right with Jesus. That's the outcome of a life with Jesus. That's Paul. That's John. James. James 2. He says, look, your faith, if it has no works, if you don't actually love people or care about people, it says dead. So that's not true faith because your faith works itself out. Uh, Paul says this too. He says, uh, our life is about faith working itself out in love. Again, we are not saved by our works, but our salvation is proven by our works. <laughs> or to use Jesus's language here, our entrance into the kingdom, that's what he's talking about. Our entrance into the kingdom is not earned by good deeds, but our entrance into the kingdom is revealed by our good deeds. And here he says, <coughs> excuse me, here he says, we are to be a people. One of those deeds that's working itself out is love. And let me say this, Providence, just by way of encouragement, I do think this is one of our greatest strengths as a people. Um, I cannot anymore count the stories of people having tangible needs in this church being met by the people in this church. City group after city group after city group has raised money to meet needs, has given meals, has given rides, has done all sorts of crazy things because when there is a need, there are people meeting those needs. We have a prayer and care team who's labored in prayer and has tried to meet tangible needs. Our elders have stepped into all sorts of random situations just to be there and try to meet needs. I, I think our church is full of people who are doing this. Where there is a need, there are people trying to meet that need. And that's beautiful because that is a marker of the people of God. And I think that's a marker of our church. This is what it means to be a kingdom citizen. You're in the kingdom, you're in the family, you're wanting to live for the end. We're a people of love. Remember what Paul said, if we get everything in eternity, I can live this life for you. I don't have to live for me anymore. I get to live for you. So for all those who trust in Jesus alone for our salvation and who are looking toward the second coming, how do we live today? Jesus says that we will be prepared, we will be faithful, and we'll be loving. May we as a church continue in this more and more. Let's pray. Father, God, you are so good to take sinners and rebels like us, and you don't just save us, but you transform us. We are a people that in our sin are slothful, consuming the things of the world, and you transform us to be prepared. God, we are a people who want to work for ourselves or, or do the things that we want to do, and you've transformed us to be a faithful people. God, we are a people who are consumed and concerned about ourselves, and you're transforming us into a community of love. God, this is done by your spirit, and so we are grateful to you. And God, we pray that you would do this more and more, that we as a church would have our eyes set on eternity, that heaven would be in our eyes, that that would be the thing we are fixated on, and that that would drive us to being a people who are faithful and who are loving. God, would you do this more and more in our church? We need you, and we want to honor you and glorify you by being faithful and by being loving to one another. Would you do this in us? In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father.